Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us for another TOFS online event, where hopefully you're going to find out an awful lot more talking with our expert about speech and language. So tonight we're joined, uh, I'm very pleased to say, by Laura Baird, who is the lead specialist speech and language therapist from Cambridge University Hospital. Good evening. Good evening. I'll hand over now, I think, to my colleague Diane, who will lead us through the first two questions which our members have sent in to us. We've combined all of these together, so hopefully we won't need to respond to any others, as it were, on the night. Diane. Thanks, John. Laura, hi there. Thanks again for joining us. Um, so the first question I've got to ask you will no doubt resonate with an awful lot of our audience here this evening. Um, and these parents have an 18-month-old who used to enjoy eating. Um, she would have puree and melted sticks, but more recently she seems to have gone off food altogether. She plays with solids and the, the purees that she used to eat. And how would you suggest the parents approach this? Um, is there a way of knowing that it's whether because the child isn't hungry or an issue with her swallow or perhaps a behavioural challenge for parents? What would be your approach? Um, there's potentially a few different things within that. Um, first of all, it's needing to work out if actually it's just age appropriate picky eating, uh, which we usually see between two and four years. But, you know, 18 months with a child with multiple health conditions who's probably had multiple admissions to hospital and log stays as well, um, it wouldn't be surprising to see. So that could almost be your behavioral element. Um, and then it's working out actually, or is it potentially an aversion or, or behavioral um, eating? And for that, you really need to consider what may have led to that. Um, aversion, aversion comes from experience. So is there something that has maybe led to a change in the experience that's made negative, um, made eating and drinking a little bit more negative so that they're less willing to engage with it? So for that, you'd want to know um, she's playing with solids, but in what kind of way? Is she just touching them with her hands or putting them in her mouth, having a taste? And then it's just the swallowing she's not wanting to do. So there's a few different questions there. Um, in terms of the hunger, that, that can be a factor. It's worth looking at how much milk um, is she having? Is she fully orally feeding or is she having NG or gastrostomy feeds? In which case hunger may be uh, quite a strong factor there. And for that, you probably want to talk to a gastroenterologist or a dietitian about that and work out if there's something that needs to be changed in the diet. Um, a dietitian and a speech therapist together really should be able to look into it more and and give a better a better idea of what you can do. It's um, it's it's more complex than just what one person can usually manage. You normally need that team approach to find the right answer. Um, I guess in that team approach can be an issue for some parents, as you know. But anyway, we'll come back to that later on. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, the next question is from parents who ask if it's normal for children born with a white off to take some time to get their food down. And um, this parent sometimes hears a plop sound a few minutes after the baby eats. Yes, absolutely. Um, anyone who's had an esophageal atresia uh, will have an element of esophageal dysmotility. So that's basically what we expect from the esophagus it, if it's formed normally, is that you get this peristaltic wave that does this action and it pushes any food and drink down. And when you've had an esophageal atresia, the lower portion of the esophagus hasn't actually developed properly. The nerves haven't developed properly. So it doesn't work the same way as what someone who hasn't had an OA um, has. So what you can get with the, that dysmotility, and we see it quite a lot on radiology scans, is food or drink kind of bouncing around in that midsection below the anastomosis usually in the esophagus, and then just suddenly drops into the stomach. So it's it wouldn't be unusual at all if you're hearing that. Um, and it's probably worth keeping an eye on if you're noticing that um, when baby's already quite little, um, and potentially looking at discussing that with your surgeon at some point because severe dysmotility can cause some eating problems and it's probably something that you want to be on top of, particularly as they're expanding their diet, eating more foods because there might be some strategies or some um, adaptations that you need to make to make eating a little bit easier for them. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, so, Nora, moving on to the next question. Um, these members have asked if you know of any good resources or web sites or social media pages um, for OA tough babies who are also displaying allergies. Basically, Anything you can suggest? Um, aside from NHS websites or Allergy UK, um, the best people to talk to would be 
a pediatrician or a dietitian, they are going to be able to give you the best information about allergies. It's definitely not um, an area of expertise for myself. Um, the next member has asked, has told us that their baby is currently a little off with her bottles. Um, could it be that she needs to go up a teeth size as opposed to it being a medical issue? Um, it's very possible. Um, teeth size and flow rates usually aren't a massive factor for babies going off their bottles. Um, efficient feeders can generally feed from a slow flow teat as well as a fast flow teat. Um, babies who have more trouble with feeding will feed better from a slow flow teat than a fast flow teat. Um, if it is, if, if it is just that the slow is a little bit flow, uh, the flow is a little bit slower than they're, they're wanting, then they might just need to work a little bit harder or they might start to get a little bit annoyed rather than going off their feeds completely. Um, our guidance for deciding when a baby needs to move up a teat size, um, is usually the teats collapsing. So if you pull it out of their mouth, the whole teat has collapsed down. You don't tend to see that quite so often anymore. The way that newer bottles are designed is that the venting system prevents, um, the air from all being sucked out of the bottle it allows for better air exchange so the teats don't collapse quite so regularly um the other way is if you've got a baby who's got a really strong coordinated nutritive suck so not not like a comfort suck not um not just a little bit of non-nutritive just kind of quick fluttery sucks at the teat if they've actually got a really strong should be very productive suck and the feed is taking ages or there's very little milk coming out probably they would benefit from going up a teat size then. Um, sudden changes in feeding are definitely worth keeping an eye on for a, a baby with TOF OA um, because they can sort of be an indication that something's changed in the picture. So are the feeds taking a really long time? Uh, is the breathing still the same? Um, increased drooling, needing to take really frequent breaks coming off the bottle. Some of those can be signs that a stricture is developing. Um, and also looking at, is there any discomfort being shown? Because could that be a sign of some dysmotility or some reflux that needs managing as well? So it's worth looking at the whole picture. It won't just be about the teeth size. Well, that's very useful. Thank you, Laura. And the final question for me in this particular section is why are some babies born with a weight of automatically given salt involvement? for feeding and swallowing when some more. Now, that's quite a tricky question um, it to put to you, but it's it's very hard for parents to go it alone. It is, and I think it's really important that it's, yeah, it's important to know sort of how to manage that as well. So there's probably quite a lot of factors. Um, and the first one's probably the, the dreaded postcode lottery um, that really isn't good enough, but unfortunately is kind of the way things are at the moment. Um, and in that case, some areas actually just don't have speech language therapists, um, whether in the hospitals or out in the community. Um, we know that there are neonatal units in this country that don't have access to AHPs and speech language therapists in particular. Um, so, you know, the greatest involvement that we have with our families with OA and TOF is on the neonatal unit. We are there as soon as feeding's about to be established all the way through until they're discharged and then we see them periodically when they are coming back in for dilatations or other procedures or for contrasts as well. So we follow through quite a lot, but we're in a fortunate, fortunate position where we have people on our unit. So when you've got a unit or a hospital that doesn't have someone there, you're not getting either that initial support with feeding or any of that follow up either. Um, in the community, it can be a little bit more difficult because um, some areas, as I say, just don't have speech therapy. Um, and my recommendation there to any of our families that go to any area where there's no speech therapy available for any reason is write to the commissioning service and raise that to them. Uh, if they haven't had it raised that there is an issue and there's a need, they won't recognize the need. So the more that you write to them, the more you tell them why this profession is important to your area, um, the more they can start to recognize and then business cases can be developed and they can look at bringing those teams in. And we've had some success in some areas with that. So I do, I do recommend if you are really struggling to access, then write to the commissioners about that and make it known that you're struggling. Um, the other issue with sometimes that you find in community is that a lot of the time feeding problems for children with OATOF are quite transient. I often find with the babies that I see on NICU, I see them quite a lot in the first year. They come back in fairly regularly for dilatations if they're coming in with strictures, but beyond that first year. We don't see them very much. And usually the feeding issues that are identified are directly related to the stricture. 
we know that these children are more likely to have feeding and swallowing issues. We know that that persists for a longer period of time. Um, I think that knowledge is still very much emerging. This is still a very specialist area for speech language therapy in particular. So there's still lots of learning and development to do within the profession, but that is definitely growing. Um, so when you get a team that maybe doesn't see a lot of children with TOF OA, they won't know that. And if they don't have ready access to radiology, to surgeons, to ENTs, respiratory consultants, um, it can be really difficult for them to pick out actually what is a swallowing problem um, versus what is, you know, how many children with TOF OA get diagnosed with asthma. And actually, sure. but actually it's a swallowing problem and mm-hmm. that's what's causing some of the, the breathing issues. So if you don't have that team approach, uh, it can be really difficult to tease out those issues. So I think as a first step, if you don't have access in your area to speech language therapy, write to commissioning and make it known to them that you need that. And for us as a profession, it's about those of us who do work in this field a lot, sharing that knowledge and making sure that everybody that is out there working with children is aware that they need to be working with these children and that these families do need help. Okay, well, thank you for that, Laura. And that's where TOS can play a role as well, I guess, in flagging up those issues amongst areas where there isn't that concern. Thank you for that. I'm going to pass you over to John, who's going to um, put some more questions to you. Hi again. And just before we, we move on with some further questions, I should perhaps let everybody know. Um, in the chat on this call, my colleagues have put in a couple of links to a large number of the resources which are on the TOPS website. We've got loads of stuff on there about food, weaning, swallowing, etc., including several different videos of different types. If you don't know that stuff there, do use the links, take a look, uh, and at least uh, get up to speed with what, what information we've got available for you all the time. But to move back on with the substantive of this evening, some more tricky questions about feeding. The next one is to do with an 11-month-old TOF baby who had a gastric pull-up six months. Um, the parents are trying to transition from 18 hours a day judge feeding to oral feeding, but struggling with mouth aversion as well as wrenching and gagging. Doesn't sound much fun, does it? Uh, the child puts everything in his mouth, not just food, or well, spoons with food on. Um, speech and language specialists have been great but they're making no progress really, or that's what the parents fear, and find the balance between encouraging feeds and not creating negative experiences is ever so hard to to, to manage. Any suggestions would be very much welcomed. Um, So obviously if there's been a gastric polyp at six months, we're talking a long gap. Um, So immediately my first thought is we've had a child who potentially has been nulled by mouth for a really long time. whether they've been able to do a bit of sham feeding on their neonatal unit or their PICU, or actually has just had no oral stimulation. Um, we know that that alone can create oral aversions. Um, so that's a really difficult one to, to manage. Um, there's a few more things that probably need answering in that one. So in terms of judge feeding, uh, is there, are you attempting to go from Judge feeding straight to oral, or have you done some trials of gastric tolerance as well? Because again, with a gastric pull up, um, reflux is known to be so much worse than for a, a tough away that's been repaired really quickly. Um, so that we know again, that can really significantly impact on oral feeding and aversion rates. So um, that's that's pro- that may have some impact and particularly with the riching and the gagging is that just related to the food is that just a sensory response to food or stimulate or oral stimulation or is that actually gastric discomfort as well that's um leading to that response so for me i would consider this quite a complex feeding case that i would not be able to manage on my own this is this is one that would absolutely need a full multidisciplinary team to support with i would be looking heavily to my dietitians and my gastroenterologists to give some guidance around gastric tolerance, doing some gastric trials, um, looking at actually what, what can we feed safely, what's going to be kind of the best tolerated, the most benign. Um, and it's, it becomes more difficult as well because aversion stems from that experience. So if you've had a baby who's been in the NICU for a really long time, not having that oral stimulation, not having that opportunity to feed, this is a new experience for them and it's it's quite scary for them as well. Um, 
then also considering have there been any episodes leading up to now that may have scared them you know if anyone if children have had a choking episode or have had a blue episode um, is that some is that related to feeding and has that been something that's maybe put them off feeding as well so it's looking at what experiences they've had and really focusing on all the experiences moving forward being really positive um and that can often be really difficult but it sometimes it means actually taking a step back from oral feeding and looking at all the things around oral feeding um, and there's lots of different models to support with that. Things like SOS or um, Suzanne Evans-Morris describes some really nice models for building confidence before you build competence with food. Um, so, also, you know, making sure as well that your baby is still getting the nutrition and hydration. There's, you know, we want we want children to be hungry. We want them to feel hunger so that they're motivated to eat as well, but not at the expense of their well-being and their nutrition and hydration. So that's where you need to work really, really closely as a team to make sure that all those needs are being met. So you're putting that really strong foundation down to then start building on those skills. So I think it's it's a case of continuing to work with your team and making sure that you've got your whole team there and making sure that all of those areas are being covered and that everyone's looking at your child as a whole, not just looking at their individual aspects because it all comes together in the end. So if they're not doing it together, then you're just going to have very fragmented care. Well, that sounds like quite a comprehensive answer, which obviously a, a very tricky situation. I hope it's very much uh, useful to the parents. Thank you. Perhaps we could move on to the next one. Um, again, a fairly tricky one about feeding through an NG tube. Uh, two questions on that. So so the first one is from the mum of, uh, of a little boy who's three months old, who was born three months premature though, uh, who's struggling to drink milk. They use Neocape formula Vata bottle with a newborn slow flow teat, but also depend on the NG tube. He coughs whilst he's drinking, only managing 40 or 50 mils via a bottle topped up by a tube. A feed can take over an hour, and he's often sick after a feed. His omeprazole has been optimised to reflect his weight. However, there still is reflux, and so Gaviscon Infant is, is being used regularly as well. The Gaviscon makes the milk difficult to pass down the tube. Gosh, one thing makes another thing more difficult, doesn't it? <laughs> We're booked for a video x-ray at Gosh. Any suggestions for this age group or things that might make things easier for the parents? Um, I always say with, with preemies, um, working mostly on the NICU is once you've done, once all the kind of initial surgery and the stabilization are done, you have to look at that child as a preemie. You have to consider the fact that they've been born early and manage that prematurity. So we, we get quite a few babies born early with Toffo away on our unit and we're, we we've got a great team and we all work really well together and it works really nicely and there's good recognition that actually there's going to be some time um between that repair and getting feeling established and not wanting to push our babies and making sure that we're doing things in the safest manner possible um so for babies born early uh, the main feeding issues that they usually have are down to their sock swallow breathe coordination uh, their regulation and their ability to maintain a quiet alert awake state in order to feed for long enough um, if they end up with jaundice, jaundice makes them really, really sleepy, so that can slow things down. Uh, there's a developmental stage between about 34 and 37 weeks where things slow down as well. So if all of those things have been managed really well at the very start, brilliant, then you've already set that good foundation for feeding. And then looking forward, um, I would be very concerned with any baby, let alone one born early, taking an hour to feed. Um, we put the recommendation to all of our parents, regardless of the background of the child that 30 minutes should be the maximum the energy expenditure so how much energy they're putting out is going to overtake what they're getting in when you go beyond that time so you start to see impact on growth and on energy levels if you're feeding them for longer than that so if you're needing to feed for longer than about half an hour sometimes I'll stretch to 45 minutes depending on the baby depending on the situation half an hour is usually I'll go to um then actually um prolonged feed times are a risk factor and a sign of unsafe feeding. So it's definitely something to be looked at. The fact you've already got the video, um, I'm assuming that's a video swallow um, booked to Great Ormond Street is brilliant because uh, your baby's showing clinical signs of aspiration. So it would be good to see why that is. Um, have a look at actually what's causing it. Is there something that can be done to support with that? Um, thickening feeds is always tricky and it's it's such an inexact science as well. And there's such contradictory evidence as to how useful it is. And then 
it's really annoying because if you're offering the bottle and you're having to thicken that feed and then you're having to then put that feed down the tube we know that smaller size feeding tubes in particular really don't like thickened liquids going down them um, it either moves really slowly or there's a risk of blockage so it becomes really difficult trying to to manage that and for some babies we would actually say have a have x and x volume and thicken x volume offer that by the bottle and put the rest down the tube as thin but that's a discussion that you need to have with your team um, and it will obviously depend on your specific circumstances as well um i time makes it easier is really the only thing um swallowing does tend to improve with time depending on the reason why the swallowing impairment is there in the first place um, and reflux as well should hopefully improve with time I, it's it's obviously a, a bigger issue in children with a top oa um but you know it's always harder when you're you're drinking milk milk sloshes all around it's easier to move if um if the lower esophageal sphincter the, the lowest muscle in the esophagus isn't functioning properly which again we know happens then milk can just kind of free flow in some children right back up into the esophagus and cause problems so but you don't get that issue so much hence your thickening when you go and you start weaning um, it tends to sit a little bit better once it gets into the stomach it's there a bit better so for now um for that family i would say wait for that video swallow wait for some advice from the team um don't be afraid of using your nasogastric tube it's there to support you while you don't have the answer i know it's not a normal thing i know it's not something that you want to use but as a maybe short-term um, method to avoid a long-term problem um, it's a valuable tool to have well thank you for that that's very very helpful i hope it sounded very helpful to me um, our, our second question uh, in this kind of area about tube feeding, uh, this time in relation to, to weaning, the patient is seven months old, that's five months corrected, and has got oral aversion, bad reflux as well, and he's fed almost exclusively by a gastronomy tube. He's been weaned under the guidance of speech and language therapists, and whilst he's making progress, is not swallowing lots at the minute, so the parents have kept his milk at the same volume. Would you be able to make any suggestions as to when they should be cutting back on the milk and how to balance the formula and solids? This child is one of triplets, by the way. Ooh, sounds like a handful. Busy household. Um, that is one, again, for a team approach. So your speech therapist should hopefully be working with uh, the dietitian and the doctors around that because, if it, it, again, like earlier, if it's an issue of hunger and that they're having lots of milk and they're not motivated to eat or if something's making the reflux worse then those two need to have a conversation with each other and see what each one would kind of be willing to do to move things forward a little bit whether whether there is some scope to cut down the milk to see if hunger is a factor or whether you know is if it's an aversion it's related again like i said earlier to that experience and it's about building that confidence before moving forward um but your speech therapist and your dietitian working together should be able to work on that and give you some some good advice and that's a very busy household so um nicely having triplets you've got lots of models um you've got two other children there that can model hopefully some nice eating for your little one um and show some good skills and make it a more of a fun experience and monopolize on that you know use that experience use make it a fun time it's it's going to be messy it's going to be busy um just go with it that might that might be really helpful. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll hand over to my colleague, Diane, now. Thanks, Laura. I have a number of questions now I try to ask you around swallowing, weaning and stickies, of course, uh, which are familiar really to many parents of away 12 children. Um, the first one, uh, a number of members have asked what they can do at home to help improve swallowing. That's a $6 million question, isn't yeah. it? And problems they're encountering, including choking, gagging, aspirating and dribble and soft drinks. Um, so swallowing is controlled pretty much entirely by your brain. Um, so there's nothing you can do to change that, but there are factors that, that will influence it. So making sure that there isn't a stricture um, that there's no pouching, there's no diverticulum, that there's nothing structural that's going to cause a problem. Um, the other thing that we are looking at quite a lot in our team and our service and doing quite a focus on is 
the dysmotility of the esophagus as well. Um, so we do joint contrast studies um, with my team in radiology, and we will look at the child's swallowing ability, but also actually the transit through the esophagus and look at what advice we can give that might support. So you guys will actually know a lot better than me what helps. You know, I get children say to me, I need to turn this direction. I need to tilt my head this way. I need to take sips of water after every bite. You know, I have a bank of advice that has come directly from my patients, which is so valuable. And it means that actually when I get a child who comes in with some really severe dysmotility, I've got a few things up my sleeve that I can try. So it's worth, it's worth knowing what that's like. We know that dysmotility is really common. So sometimes it's about knowing what the extent of it is and what can you can do to help. Um, and then it's also, if you are having problems with aspiration, um, really struggling to move on with diets, like being stuck on purees, not being able to move to um, more textured foods, um, recurrent respiratory infections, stridor, getting that looked at, going to, going to the doctors, your surgeons, your pediatricians, your gastroenterologists, just and saying to them, this is what's happening. Um, any concerns with aspiration, you should have a speech therapy review and you should have an instrumental assessment. So usually a video fluoroscopic swallow study, um, any stridor or any noisy breathing, ENT review, that's an airway issue and, um, you know, it should be looked at again. Um, choking as well, um, looking at it in terms of, I guess, the developmental stage of your child, younger children are more likely to choke if they're given inappropriate foods than older children but you know children with toffee away can also experience stickies and if they've got an unsafe swallow it might put them at increased risk of choking um, a video fluoroscopic swallow study can help to identify that risk as well and make some suggestions about diet modifications so yeah definitely a six million pound question well that's very helpful thanks laura moving on from that if a five-year-old still has a problem drinking water What's the best way that you would recommend to drink it? Would it be through a straw, cup with valves? Uh, difficult to say. Um, I would want to know with that child, is this a long-standing problem? Um, were there any problems with feeding as an infant? Is there an undiagnosed swallowing issue there? And uh, would a speech language therapy review and maybe an instrumental assessment of swallowing be beneficial for this child? Um, we... As speech therapists for children quite like open cups for children in terms of development, jaw stability, um, how it links with your chewing and your swallowing. Open cups are the most normal thing to do, but obviously these days, and I, when I was working in community, this was always a conversation we had. Everyone walks around with drink bottles and they could be the little sports zipper tops or whatnot. So actually go with what's functional, go with what works. Um, if it, if there is a swallowing problem straws can actually present quite a risk um, straws put liquid quite far back in the mouth quite close to the pharynx and give you less time to get control and to coordinate and trigger a swallow um, whereas liquid from a cup introduces to the front of the mouth there's a lot more preparation manipulation that needs to happen to do that so if there is a, an actual dysphagia or a swallowing issue then um, that should really be investigated and they'll be able to give you the best advice about what to do. Hey, thank you, Laura. And there'd be some urgency with that problem, I'm guessing, as well. I Yeah, I'd get that one looked at quite quickly, I think, especially yeah. for a five-year-old. That's the social implications for that as well. That's a child who would be at school, you know, coughing and spluttering at school when they're trying to eat their lunch. That's not yeah, pleasant. So if they're getting chest infections, yeah. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, the next question, my son is eating really well, but has plateaued on certain foods, still causing stickies. How do those parents progress with that situation? Well, that's really difficult because, again, it comes down to that that dysmotility and that esophagus, which, um, you know, there's teams of researchers desperately trying to fix that problem. They're desperately looking into it um, and they haven't got any way because, again, it comes down to that nerve and muscle function. Um and it's, it's really tricky because some children do then get really, really stuck if it's really severe or if they've got a diabetic and they've got a stricture. Moving on to those kind of more age-appropriate textures is really difficult and it can cause real problems. Um, it's probably... It, it's knowing what, what foods 
cause problems and what foods don't and maybe looking at the differences between them. We know that dry, hard, stodgy foods tend to cause more of a problem, tend to get stuck more. But you can modify, if you can modify them to make them a bit thinner, a bit runnier, um, lubricate with a bit of a sauce or a gravy, we often say as well. Sometimes that can help. Um, smaller pieces sometimes is more useful, so there's less to have to break down. Following with a drink, as long as it's not caused, as long as um, the food hasn't caused an impaction, um, that sometimes can help. It's it's going to be a bit of trial and error. Um me, if I got that referral, would bring them into radiology and look at them, but that's not an option for everyone. I'm no. very fortunate with being able to do that. Okay. Well, thank you, Laura, for that. Um, can you please explain to our audience tonight what exactly happens when a tough child has a blue episode during feeding? So the most common cause of the blue episode is severe tracheomalacia, which... Um, so when you have a TOF and you've got that join between, I should be in the ENT, but I hang up my ENT is enough. Um, when you've got that join between your trachea and your esophagus, you are then left with a defect in that point of the trachea and it leaves a bit of floppy tissue. And then that can actually kind of collapse in on the airway. So that's when you hear your TOF cough or we um, might hear some stridor when usually when children are really active. So in babies, we'll hear it when they start feeding. They'll start to get this really noisy breathing. Um, if that collapse happens quite in an extreme way or, and that airway closes off completely, that will stop sufficient airflow from going through the trachea to the lungs. And that would then cause children to have those blue episodes. Um, that's kind of the more classic sort of tracheomalacia. Um, you can also get blue episodes if you've got a stricture and something's got impacted or got stuck and then you've got some out pouching at, the, at that point. And when you've got that kind of weakness in that tracheal wall, you can get pushing from that so that pouch into that and that can also cause some of that um, collapse on that trachea as well. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Um, the final question in this section relating to swallowing is the mum of a two and a half year old um, who's told us that she's trying to educate her son how to chew and swallow. She's trying to understand the sensations he might feel and she asks, what would you expect and how can she help? Yeah. That's a, that's quite a tricky one. Um, it's because a lot of um Chewing and swallowing is innate. Swallowing obviously is controlled by your brain. It's neurological. You don't have any control over that, um, but you do have control over the eating side and mm -hmm. whether you put something far enough back in your in your mouth to trigger a swallow. So it's really nice. You're trying to understand what sensations he's feeling. You're trying to understand what that what the whole act of eating is like for him. And obviously, he doesn't have the language to be able to tell you that. So it's yeah. that's quite a difficult um, thing to think of. Um, yeah, it's that, I'm not sure I can really answer that mm -hmm. one for you, but I, I'm, I'm going to commend that mum for, for thinking <laughs> about her child in that way. It's really lovely. Mm, absolutely. And I guess if she's relaxed, even though it was easier said than done, that transfers to the child to a degree as well, but, yeah. um, it's a tricky one to respond to, isn't it? Yeah. I, it's, I, <sighs> Generally, if children, the, the children that we would tend to work with, um, remember, I, I see children who have got health problems and I've worked in child disability. I, you know, normal is not something I see. Um, so all the children that I've worked with who have had swallowing or chewing issues are children who have had quite significant disabilities. So they've had another diagnosis, cerebral palsy, um, something along those lines. So in that sense, you kind of think, well, those muscles don't work properly and you have to, the, the pathways don't develop normally. You have to teach what they need to do so there's skills to develop whereas with a, a, a typically developing child um, these are things that they should learn by watching so maybe for in that case look at their exposure have they you know i used to see lots of children who parents would come to me in the community and say oh i really need them to start eating with a spoon they don't know how to eat with a spoon and they're two years old and i'm like okay how do you feed them at home oh no i feed them no they don't hold the spoon so you're like, that's why your child can't eat with a spoon because they've never held the spoon. That's a new experience for them. So we need to teach them that new experience. So look at actually what, what's that child been exposed to previously. 
is this a child who's actually had really long periods of being nil by mouth or not having oral intake? In which case, again, this is a new thing for them. Um, there might be an element of fear or, or lack of confidence there that needs to be built up before you get to, to the chewing and swallowing. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Laura. Moving on now to weaning. Um, and this family is just about to start weaning. Any top tips as we're going in blind? Oh, oh good luck. Um, keep it smooth. Keep it runny. Um, early on, it's, you know, uh, until you really know what the, how the esophagus is functioning, how everything's working. Um, milk is great because um, liquids will just flow through anything. So any narrow spaces, any, you know, you're, you're generally okay. It'll, it'll go through. Um, food can sometimes obviously be a bit more difficult. And if there is, dis again, dysmotility, favorite topic at the moment, um, it, that's going to move a bit slower and maybe need a bit more um, support and management. So what I always advise my families when they are getting to weaning is smooth, runny purees. Don't feel the need to introduce lumps very quickly. Most typically developing children don't tolerate lumps. Most adults don't like lumps. It's it's a sensory experience that lots of people actually just don't tolerate. So there is no requirement for children to eat lumpy food. Um, you know, and then I say to them, once you've got them really coping really well with those smooth, runny purees, you can start to thicken it up slightly and see how they manage. Um, I tend to avoid recommending um, too much kind of solid food, food that needs lots of chewing, lots of breaking down in that really early stage. And I know that there are some centers that actually recommend purees up till two years. We don't do that, but I can understand why they do say that. And in the end, each child is very individual as well. You need to take it based on how they're tolerating. But my starting point is always smooth, runny, make it easy, build up really slowly when you can see that they're managing really well. Okay. Thank you, Laura. And then the best practice in terms of introducing finger food, so textures and solid food, are there any specific foods to avoid, in your opinion, or using caution with babies for with the way Toph? Um, Toph's website actually has a great list of foods that people say are really difficult. Carrots, apples, bread, uh, dry meat, steaks, um, mashed potatoes, absolute nightmares. Um, avoid them for as long as you can or significantly modify. Um, so certainly when you're starting out or when you're expanding textures, I would avoid those until you know that your child really can manage something similar to those. Um, you know, some of those foods are choking risks as well for babies. We we actually, as speech therapists, generally don't recommend you giving bread to small children. Toast actually is easier to break down and easier to manage. So uh, okay. there's a few sort of correlations there as well. So um, in terms of best practice, I don't really know that there is um, best practice. There might be some Ernica or some Espigan guidelines out there, but obviously there are, um, they can be a bit tricky to work your way through. Um, so I guess kind of what I said before, start smooth, start thin, build up slowly, look at your child's and see what they're managing and how well they tolerate. Um, in terms of developing chewing skills, um, bite dissolve textures are quite nice for that and generally won't cause too much of a problem either. Just be aware of um, the nutritional aspects of them. They often contain quite a lot of sugar. Um, so any dietitian will tell you from a nutritional aspect, a lot of bite dissolved foods are not great in that respect, but in terms of skill development, there are some benefits. And they do have their use in respect to that then, by the sound of things as well. Yeah. Um, what's your opinion, Laura, on baby led weaning? Is it something you recommend? Um, I wouldn't for a child with a repaired top OA, um, again, because it's those kind of harder textures. Um, it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot more information. I think there's actually just, there's been a book that's just been released recently, um, about baby led weaning for children with complex health needs. I think you can find it on Amazon. I cannot remember the name of it right now. Um, so there is a bit more evidence coming out, um, about it. I, most of the population I work with the children who would not cope with baby led weaning. Um, but I know some typically developing children who have really flown with it and done really well. Um, I would suggest caution 
in this group. Um, for some children, there are nutritional complications that need managing for top OA. There's obviously the issue with the dysmotility, with strictures, um, and with finding appropriate foods. So sort of my recommendation is always traditional weaning approaches for this group. Um, but, you know, go and, go and have a look at that book. Go and have a look at some of the evidence out there um, if you're interested in it. Thanks, Laura. And the final question for me is regarding speech. So a number of members have asked about the connection to speech delay um, for their children born with OA TOF. I don't think that there is a specific link between speech delay and OA TOF. Looking at the experiences of the child through their lifetime, um, children who have had repeat GAs um, can have long-term developmental effects from that. So there might be something within that side of the evidence. Um, if they've got co-occurring health conditions, um, looking at their whole developmental profile as they're going, you know, a child who's got kind of a global developmental delay is going to have a speech delay, but that's not necessarily specifically related to their top, mm. but, but a child who's maybe had, you know, 10 dilatations in a year, 10 GAs, um, multiple, or, you know, even from our, if, if I look at our long gap OA population, our NICU population, we know that early language exposure improves language outcomes um, down the line. So if you've had a child who spent quite a long time in hospital, separated from their family, not having all of that good language exposure, um, then you could potentially say that language might be affected mm -hmm. further down the line. I think it's five and 10 that the, the studies that look at. Um, so for those kids, I would suggest, you know, talk to them all the time, put that language stimulation in, give them the best possible opportunity hospitals already a difficult place to be and we already know that children who have spent prolonged periods of time in hospital do end up with some developmental delays but they do also catch up so you know put it's putting that foundation in again as best you can but specific links i don't think there are any for those two well that's really helpful thanks so much laura for being so comprehensive in your responses i'm going to pass you back to john just for the final couple of questions yeah, thanks very much for all of that. Just before we move on to uh, those last couple of questions, I'd remind everybody that we do have quite a lot of uh, stuff related to feeding and weaning on the TOFS website. So please do take a look at that through those two links that we put up in the chat that lead you straight to the area you most, uh, most might like to be at, both videos and written articles. Hopefully uh, quite a lot of use to, to several of you if you didn't know those uh, already existed. And of course, the soft food book as well, which has got some TOF appropriate recipes. Our team loves that book. They want the recipes for themselves. It's lovely to hear that from somebody who knows really what they're talking about from a professional viewpoint. Yeah. Of this. We uh, grab so... it down off the shelf every few days and have a look at it. Yeah, well, that's lo lovely to know that. So, uh, so the last couple of questions we've got here, uh, uh, something which I think will be of great interest to so many people on this call, which is basically, does it get better with age? And we had a couple of questions uh, specific on that. One is, uh, are the feeding issues going to ask my child's whole life or do things tend to get easier with age and growth? Uh, difficult to say. I don't want to be doom and gloom, but um, dysmotility is there for life. Um, we cannot regrow those muscles and those nerves yet. Again, there's research teams desperately, desperately working on that. Um, so they, it, we do say that this is a lifelong condition. Um, there will be some element of feeding difficulty for the rest of their life. Whether things improve, I uh, I know that there's the risk of strictures basically through your whole life, but I will often counsel my parents that actually that first year is the worst. And that's when I tend to see my, my little ones in sort of every six to 12 weeks for serial dilatations. But then we go quite a long time and I don't see them for a couple of years because everything settles down. And then when I see them back again is when their diets have expanded, they're weaning, they're eating more normal foods, and then the dysmotility becomes more apparent, and then they're back in for contrast, and we're having to work out some some ways to support with that. Um, and I have had children all the way up to 16 with that. Um, I don't see adults, so I I won't comment. I think there's um, the adult group in TOFs will probably be able to answer to that, but my understanding is that because this is an anatomical issue, that um, there will be some element of difficulty throughout their whole life. Okay, well, well thank you for that. And uh, related to that, we've got a question uh, going on about uh, 
do we have to accept that stickies will always be an issue as as our child grows up? Yes, yeah, yes, from what you just said. They might be. It, it might. Some of that might depend on how you manage it as well, and what foods you have. And I guess children, and as they get older and they turn into adults, they real they work out what works for them and what doesn't, and potentially can avoid a lot of the problems because they avoid a lot of the things that cause problems for them. Um, it's not to say that something's changed, but they they're managing it better. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's worth being aware of them, um, whether they become a problem or not. Um, Time will tell. Okay, well, thank you so much for all of that. You've said uh, an awful lot of things this evening, uh, Laura, and I very much hope uh, everybody who's listening will f will indeed find that 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 useful and, and get at least uh, quite a lot of stuff out of it. I do uh, hope so. Yeah, so so thank you very much for that. I understand that you've got a slide you might like to share with us about a study that's going on we might like people to, to contribute to. Is that right? I do. I'll put that up for you now. So the lovely Alex Stewart, who is a speech language therapist at Great Ormond Street Hospital, is um, also a near doctoral fellow. So she is in the middle, I guess, of her study, and she is looking at the feeding experiences of children and families um, who have been born with esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, she is looking, always looking for more people to join her study and to help out with pretty much exactly the questions that you guys have asked tonight and probably will have more questions of. So if you are interested, then, um, please just scan, scan the QR code, go through the link, um, and let her know that you're interested and she will be in touch. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, so, so. To move on now, that wraps up really the formal part of our evening, but we'd love to have uh, uh, you all stay on for a Q&A session, if you'd like, or maybe a chat session would be a better phrase. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Claire, now, who will explain how that's going to work. Just before Claire comes in on that, can I just mention as well that for anyone who wants to find out a little bit more about the SAFE study that Laura has mentioned for Alex Stewart, there's lots of information on the TOFS website. So have a look at that as well at the Toss and Door studies, because it'll tell you about the results of our research to date, um, as well as the link that Laura had posted earlier, um, where you can go straight on to do the survey. Some of you per perhaps already have, but the more people who do take part, the better, because it's really important that we're able to bring home to the commissioners the support that people do get and don't get in a lot of cases, unfortunately, in relation to, to feeding and swallowing. So thank you very much, Laura, tonight. And um, that's me as well, then, if, if, when Claire's ready to uh, move into the breakout rooms, which hopefully you'll all enjoy. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.